Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. They offer free checking with industry-leading mobile banking. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. What's going on, Hokies fans? We are officially just over a week away from college football and just over two weeks away from Virginia Tech football kicking off the 2024 campaign. That being said... We are so back, and we're talking all about the offense today. We got the entire football crew. It's episode 368 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, and it starts right now. It's a beautiful morning here in Blacksburg. We're recording on Thursday, August 15th, 2024 from our high-tech studios at the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Remember to like, subscribe, and refer the show to a friend and head over to techsideline.com to check out our extensive editorial content. As always, the first month of your subscription is free. Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. The TSL podcast is also sponsored by The Hokie Way, whose countdown to kickoff campaign is officially underway all this month. This is a huge campaign for The Hokie Way that generated over a half a million dollars in NIL funds last year. We'll be featuring updates on the campaign all month, so check out Tech Sideline to find out how you can donate. We'll also drop a link in the YouTube description, so be on the lookout for that as well. I'm your host, Giovanni Heater. To my right, Chris Coleman, our lead analyst and columnist. Across the way, Mr. Andy Bitter, our senior staff writer. And in the fourth chair, our managing editor, David Cunningham, the mustache man, newly proposed, newly engaged, by the way, Nick Brown. Uh, he is producing the show behind the scenes. The football crew is on set. We're officially at that time where it's feeling real. Football's back now. 16 days away, right? And uh, yeah, and so I guess nine days away from the week zero game. So yeah, we're pretty much back at this point. We're back. Yeah, the, the, I, I, like the week zero games, like the concept of that is kind of strange. I don't know if I like it, but I like the fact that there's football to watch next weekend. That's not like NFL preseason and all the nonsense yeah. that goes on with that. So uh, I'll be tuning in for sure next week. If you want to go to a college football game and just be a neutral fan, I would recommend the week zero game in Dublin. You, you. I went to the one yeah. last year. It was yeah. awesome. You yeah. go to the first game of the season. Doesn't really matter to you who wins. And and you're back into it, man. What was the one last year? Uh, Notre Dame Navy. Okay. And Notre Dame it wasn't stomped the, them. Uh, oh, it was a stomp. It wasn't the Northwestern the Nebraska game no. where they ran out of beer in like the second quarter. No. That was like the that. Year trust before, me. They I had believe. plenty of beer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they learned from their mistakes. <laughs> but they they had Carlsberg in the stadium. Maybe it was great. Well, this year it's a banger. It's Georgia Tech, Florida State, and I think as far as ACC picture goes, the, hey, week one, why not? That that's a fun one. I feel like if you, you're going to play Florida State, you want to play them in that first week when they're still trying to figure out all their transfers and how they're going to fit and stuff like that. Like, I don't know what the line is on that game, but I, I, I wouldn't sleep on Georgia Tech in that one with what they have come back. I'm not, I'm not predicting a victory in that, but I, that's when I'd look at it at least. I'm definitely going to have to I, look I at I agree the line. with that. I mean, the, Georgia Tech has, a, you know, basically a dominant quarterback and a dominant running back. And if you've got two th- those two things on offense, you know, you've got a puncher's chance in just about every game you Especially play. Especially weird things happen yeah. in week one, right? We, yeah. we think we, we talk about all offseason what these teams are going to be like, so we think we know exactly what it's going to be like. And then they get out there and you don't know. I mean, we talked about that Northwestern Nebraska game a couple of years ago. I think that was the only game Northwestern won. That season? That's right. At least only Big Ten game <laughs> yes. they won that season. So it's like, oh, same old Nebraska, which it was. But, oh, Northwestern looking good. It's like, actually, no, they're pretty bad too. So uh, who knows? That's that's why we love watching college football. The best part about Week Zero too too is in recent time they have thrown kind of a marquee game in there. Before it was just some of these smaller schools and you got that kind of yeah. little taste. But now that they throw a big marquee matchup in there, I mean, if you're an ACC fan, this is a huge game. Georgia Tech. You know, pick to be a, a top eight ish echelon team in the conference who might have a chance to compete with a great quarterback. And I then Florida love, State's the top dog. I would love Virginia Tech to be in that game one day. That would be awesome. It would have to be against a team like Georgia Tech that would give up the home game. Right. Because somebody has to give up the home game. And yep. Tech's never, Virginia Tech's never going to do that. No. Georgia Tech would. Boston College probably would. Yes, Boston College I'm would. I'm trying to think, you know, Pitt maybe would. Louisville I'm trying to think. Might. Yeah, I'm trying to think of who in the ACC. Uh, 
Duke might, I guess. I, Wake. I, Wake. Yeah, I, but uh, you know, it's going to have to be one of those teams giving up a home game because the Hokies just wouldn't do it. It's like it's like in the NFL, like who who's willing to give up the home game? It's like yeah. oh, the Jaguars. <laughs> That's why they always play. They're trying there. to move there. Jacksonville anyway. loves giving up home <laughs> games. Like we, we'll play eight games there if we need to. <laughs> yep, they played in London last year. Yep, yep. Well, uh, to answer your question, Andy, Florida State is eleven and a half point favorites as it currently sits I'd right be now. I'm tempted to take Georgia Tech. What's like, that? I'd be tempted to take Georgia Tech. I would too. That's uh, especially game one. Yeah. I wish it was a little bit higher, and then I would maybe probably go in and take Georgia yeah. Tech. But nevertheless, definitely time to get into our show here, guys. Wanted to start off with this today, to just kind of break things down a little bit. Again, we're talking all offense, offensive preview today, including the lights of Cal. SMU and Stanford Virginia Tech was the 11th best offense in the ACC last season according to pro football focus and they graded out as the eighth best rushing team in the league I think if you weed out the first four games everything looks a little bit differently there I think we can all agree on that two different seasons for Virginia Tech last year or really three different seasons well you had the first four games where they couldn't do anything against anybody um, and then you had the rest of the season where they just destroyed mediocre to bad teams and set rushing records in the process. Or they played three really good teams and couldn't do anything at all. So you well, you saw three different Virginia Tech teams play last year, basically. It was a very unique season. And once you got past that four, those first four games, there was a clear dividing line. And you, looking back... It should have been obvious where each one, the direction each one of those games was going to go. Um, I don't expect it to go that way this year um, because it's rare when you do have a season that, that's like that. Um, but I do think that those stats are misleading. Um, how much Virginia Tech has improved is going to come down to how much their offensive line has improved. I think they'll be better, but are they simply good to very good or are they very good to great? Mm. What will decide that? will be the offensive line and how good it is. Yeah, and on top of that, I think there's you know room or a belief that there's optimism around this offense right now. Basically, everybody's back. Uh, you know, the contributor you lost from last year was Daquan Wright. Uh, you know, I think they're okay at the tight end position. I don't think it's too much of a drop-off there, if any. Uh, you know, you get Kyron Drones back after a full offseason as the starter. Uh, another year of development from that offensive line, which is really a development position because you, you know it's tough to add guys from the portal and have big impact guys, as or at least it is here. I, I don't know if other schools do it well, but it seems to be tough to do here, uh, bringing guys in and plugging them in and playing. And then you get Ollie Jennings back. We're talking about the guy that was expected to be their top receiver last year. Now he's an option this year uh, and back healthy. So for all those reasons, I think you know that's why. You look at the stats last year and the way they finished, and then all the the off season, you know, optimism around this this offense. I think there's reason to believe this could be a, a pretty good offense. You guys perfectly kind of teased everything that we're going to talk about today, so that was great. Um, Want to talk projected starters, and and I don't know if everyone's going to agree uh, across the board. Obviously, at, at positions like receiver, running back, quarterback, there, there there are no question marks there. But specifically with the offensive line, I'm curious to see if you guys uh, differ in your opinions at all. But, but let's go all the way from left tackle across the offensive line, and then we'll get into the receiver's quarterback. What do you got for the offensive line projected starters at this point? You know, it started out basically the exact five that it was uh, last year. And then they kind of threw a curveball yesterday when we were at practice, and they had Lath Ganim at left guard. They have Braylon Moore at center and then Caden Moore at right guard. Um, I think they're, they're still kind of experimenting with things uh, I don't know if, if that's something they had been doing and that's their preferred lineup right now or yesterday was just one of their experimental days where where they they kind of wait and see what happens I do think that Lath Ganim is the type of guy who probably the more he's got a higher ceiling than than some other guys some of those other guys so I think the more he plays the faster he'll improve I expect him, it wouldn't shock me if at one point, some point this season he is in the starting lineup at left guard. It's not going to be at left tackle, even though he's you know technically the backup at left tackle. You've got a four-year starter there, a guy who is going to play in the NFL one day. So that spot's on lockdown. So Ganim's going to have to find another place to play, and that's probably going to be an offensive guard position. Yeah, I think you know talent wins out eventually, and, and Ganim was a blue-chip guy. And he was, I think it was the top recruit in their 2023 signing class, mm. uh, top guy in West Virginia. You would figure 
given enough time, he's going to force his way onto the field. And we might be seeing that right now. now. I don't know if, again, if that was temporary, how they were doing that, if they revert back to, to Braylon Moore at left guard, Cade Moore at center, uh, Bob Schick at right guard, or if that's just an option that they can, they can throw out there to get other guys in the game. But uh, Ganim feels like he's on the cusp. And they they tried him at tackle a little bit, a little right tackle, right guard, I think. Uh, left guard is where they have him right now. And, you know, honestly, I hadn't even thought about that that arrangement until I saw it out there on the field. And it kind of makes sense. I hadn't I mean, thought about moving I, Caden yeah, back to right guard. Yeah, I mean, Caden has played right guard before. Braylon is your backup center and probably your starting center next year if you're looking ahead like that. Uh, to get Ganim going at left guard and put him next to Chaplin and another guy who will probably be, I would assume he's not going to go to the NFL <laughs> after this year and never make too many assumptions with this whole thing or transfer because, you know, left tackles can command a pretty heavy salary if they're solid guys. But, uh, you know, you could have your center left guard left tackle set up for next year without turning that over. Uh, so it's just something to consider. Yeah, They're, they're going to make the decision that's best for the short term. But sometimes you want to have that long-term thinking too. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Uh, I would have. I think both more players are good players, but lined up right next to each other, that makes center and left guard together a little bit undersized, in my opinion. Like uh, neither like neither one of those guys are particularly Braylon or particularly huge guys. Like I think I would rather have Braylon at center full time. To be honest with you, I think that's his best position on the offensive line. But even if you move Caden to the right, you've still kind of got the same thing, both of them together. But I, I would rather have, if I'm going to have one of them be undersized, I'd rather have the undersized guy be at center, which is where that normally works. Uh, you'd like to see Montavious Cunningham turn it on, you know, and, and get some more size. In they had him at right tackle yesterday yeah so, so maybe it, that's an it, option it, it, it could be again he he was recruited as a versatile guy i was expected that he was going to challenge for the right guard spot but almost all of his playing time in college has come at right tackle so uh maybe he's just maybe he just wasn't coming on at guard or again maybe we just caught him in one of their advanced vice days right right where everybody just, moved one spot to the left yes so exactly <laughs> we're playing musical chairs on the offensive line the key though is at this time last year we wouldn't have been having this conversation because they had no other options outside of their five starters they had no other options for anybody else to come in the game and help them out, really. So this is a good problem this to is, have. Yeah, right. I'm, uh, they had five, then like Brody Meadows two, was a, right. a six guy, yeah. sort of. But now it's like Meadows, Cunningham, maybe Johnny Garrett. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're, you know, Ganim's going to fit in there somewhere, whether there's a starter or a backup, Bob Schick. Uh, feels like they can go seven, maybe eight. And you know, like, you know, last year when guys weren't performing – they didn't have much option. They just had to kind of roll what they were going with. And now you could rotate some guys in, try some different lineups to, to maybe spark things up yeah. there. So it, it's certainly different. Briefly, let's kind of break things down numbers-wise uh, for some of these guys. I have some numbers in front of me here. Tech was 85th in the country in pass block last year, 107th uh, in run block. Starting with Braylon Moore, he was actually the highest rated returner for Virginia Tech. He also played 600 snaps last season. His pass blocking was significantly better than his run blocking. What do we like about Braylon Moore heading into this year? Um, I think uh, he's a his tenacity. You know, he's a tough guy. Both Moore, Moore brothers are tough. I do think Braylon at guard is a little undersized for a guard in the modern game, which is why all, I've always been an advocate of moving him to center. And having a rotation there with his brother, and then Braylon takes over as the starter after this year. So I, I'm hopeful that that's the spot where he he plays uh, most of his uh, snaps this year. I, I do think it's a little bit unfair uh, to judge him as a guard simply because of his size. But uh, you know, once he gets into his natural position long term, I think he'll be a good player. Did you say 105th in run blocking? Uh, 107th in run blocking, 85th in pass block. Like there's. Such a disconnect to me between that run blocking grade and the running results they had. I mean, they were fourth in the ACC at 189.7 rushing yards a game. The offensive line had something to do with that. And I'm not saying they had everything to do with that. And I realize there was a lot of misdirection and, you know, the way they use drones and tooting coming along and, uh, you know, the option elements they have in this offense. But the fourth ranked Russian offense in the, in the ACC based on yardage, but they're in the hundreds in run block. Yeah. That seems off to me. It, it's, I, like I don't, I don't take the PFF grades as gospel. 
Uh, I don't know who's doing the grading. I don't know how they grade that stuff. But something just seems off to me. I've always that. found that it's uh, the grades that I always question the most, whether it's individuals or team-wise, was run blocking grades. Um, I always thought that like Dalton Keene, for example, had lower grades than that I thought than my eyes showed me th- that he should have had. Um, that being said, last year th- those grades are interesting because last year Tech either dominated or they got thrashed. It's right? true. Yeah, I'm not right. denying that yeah. the, the O line needed to improve last right. year. I just felt like maybe it. But wasn't I agree. Hundred. Se- it doesn't feel a hundred seventh worse. Yeah, I would probably put it around eightieth. Or something, sure. in my opinion, something like that. But the, but that's just watching Virginia Tech play and not watching. I was going to say else. that's the yeah. tough thing. We, we're not yeah. watching pretty right. much anybody else, especially outside of the the ACC. Also, um, most of us not anywhere qualified to judge <laughs> offensive line play in terms of like the technical aspects right. of it. It's like, oh, did they do their assignment? This like, I've got no clue. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, you could you could start explaining to me like, oh, it's a you know, hook block here, and you do all this. Like, I have no idea. I have no idea what you're talking about. You could be speaking French. For all I'm concerned. So th- that's why, you know, I look at the numbers. And I'm like, who's doing the judging on this? Sure. Are these like football people that get it? Do, you, do they understand the scheme and what they're trying to accomplish on every player? That is like watching a player and whether, you know, he beat his individual block or something it's, like it's, that. It's a lot easier to grade some of the other positions than it is offensive line because of exactly what well, they're working in concert. You, you know, right. it's you know, <laughs> five fingers in the fist, right? That's, yeah. that's how it, it works, right? So. Uh, yeah, I just sometimes I question some of those grades. We we just take them for gospel and like, well, this is what PFF said. It's like, okay, well, is that the truth of what's happening? Right. Well, I think there's one guy that you can't dispute uh, some of the grades for. I mean, there's talks of Xavier Chaplin being an NFL caliber yeah. tackle. Uh, he played 813 snaps this past season. What do we like about him, and and how can he take things kind of to another level this season? Uh, first of all, his work ethic. You know, when he was in high school, at one point I think he was up around three seventy to three eighty. So he's worked really hard and lost a lot of weight over the years. And generally, when guys who show that level of dedication to change their bodies, they will be a success m- more times than not. Um, I think he's just got natural talent too uh, that, that you can't deny. We've heard through the grapevine that he was one of Virginia Tech's most sought-after players this past offseason. Now he was not in the transfer portal, but that's modern football. You're going to have to you just have to deal with stuff like that. Sure. Anybody with his talent level who has three years of eligibility left can be can command six figures, maybe mid to high six figures if they entered the portal, depending on which programs recruited them. I mean, we saw I saw this past year when Tech was recruiting a number of transfer portal guys. I mean, a lot of them had three years of eligibility left. They didn't play well last year, but most offense, most young offensive linemen don't play well, but they were still getting recruited by like the Oklahomas. Wasn't and, that and that guy from Arkansas? Yes. What was his name? Yes, I forget his name. And even the kid from Appalachian State. Yeah, the guy from Arkansas was like pretty bad. Yes, <laughs> pretty bad. Year, but but everybody, it's but all every, about projection. Right, yeah. but everybody wanted him. Um, the, the kid from uh, Appalachian State who was who was local who ended up going to Oklahoma, oh, well, yeah. he was very mediocre. And actually his playing time tailed off as the season went along. But he's got three years left. There's just not that many decent offensive linemen out there. So uh, I, those guys command a lot in the portal, but Virginia Tech was able to hang on. So I think that shows that Virginia Tech's NIL is in a pretty good place right now. And Troy Everett. Troy Everett. Name. That was it. That, yep, that's it. Um, and I, I think, I think, you know, Pry has talked about when they go to 105 scholarships next year. How do you allocate those extra 20 spots? Well, you're going to have a backup long snapper, a backup kicker, and a backup punter now. But we'll, and, you know, a few of your walk-ons are going to get scholarships. But what about the rest of those? I would legitimately use four or five extra scholarships for the offensive line because it's such a difficult position to recruit. It's such a crapshoot. <clears throat> you have two-star Christian Darisaws turning into All-Americans in first-round picks, and you have four stars like Aaron Brown, who was like one of the Virginia Tech's most highest recruited players ever, never got on the field for like a single snap during his career. That's offensive line recruiting. The more bodies you throw at it, you know, the more likely you're going to you know, get good players. Get so, some to yeah, stick. Exactly. Right. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I think Chaplin is, is an interesting one because how many guys start four years at left tackle for you? It's like I'm trying to think of players over the I years. Guess, I mean, Darisau left early. He would have otherwise uh, – in my career, you know, Dick Ricochet, Ferguson, 
at UVA who went on to be a great uh, professional for I mean, didn't miss a snap like his entire career basically uh, in the pros. So those are a couple guys that that did it, and they were exceptional players. I don't I don't know if Chaplin's going to get to that level, but. <laughs> You know, they put him in a position that, you know, he's pretty solid out there, and it's his second year as a starter. I, th- I think he's got incredible growth potential there still. Not even Dwayne Brown, because he was a red... He he's a tight end. He was yeah. tight end until his red shirt sophomore I mean, R- year. Sergio Render started right away, correct? <clears throat> yeah, but he was a guard. He was a guard. Um, Jonathan McLaughlin was a four-year starter. I don't remember which tackle position he started at his... His, yeah, he was yeah. he was kind of left tackle, right tackle, yeah. he bounced back and yeah. forth. So maybe that's you know one case where right. it wasn't like as exceptional as those other two I mentioned. But I, you know, I think Chaplin, I don't think they're moving him no. from left tackle. I think he's left tackle until he's done here. Yeah, I wanted to ask you guys, and now this has kind of been been flipped on its head just a little bit. I was going to ask you how important is it to have a returning center in Caden Moore, and now you think <laughs> that there might be a little bit of a shuffle there. Well, I think it's important to return Caden Moore. Whether he's at center or right guard, um, I think he's a phys- he's a pretty physical player. Um, I think he's got the right mentality. He can cover two different spots for for the Hokies, which and that versatility always brings value. Uh, you know, I do think he's all he will. I do think he's going to be at center. I okay. do think he'll start at center for Virginia Tech. I just I would like to get a little bit more you know size on the offensive line, and he brings uh, he brings this. Uh, size to the table I, I again i just and i like both more brothers i just don't necessarily think it's a great combination to have them starting next to each other i'd like to have them both play in center that's the downside and if they go with this new arrangement is that you you lose the progress that caden made last year mm-hmm. uh as the starting center so i think you'd want that uh after you know the big deal they made out of the move him moving inside last year I think he'd want to, you know, benefit from that experience and have a, a second-year guy in that spot, a three- or four-year start. I forget how many years exactly he started overall. Uh, and somebody who's a fifth-year guy. I mean, that experience is important at that position where you're making the calls and, you know, have to make you know, different adjustments and stuff up front. So uh, that's why I agree. I, I think Caden would probably start at center, but, you know, we're two weeks away from the season, and they've got a different alignment that we saw at practice the other day. So maybe that's more than just uh, an experiment. What you got, David? When we were at Media Day uh, a couple of weeks ago, I asked Aeneas Peebles, you know, what he's seen from the offensive line. This is a guy who's been around the ACC for a while, and he said this group of offensive linemen is maybe the best group of communicators. Like, it's the best communication I've ever seen amongst an offensive line group. Um, and I asked Ron Crook about it, and he just praised the guy's work ethic. And that group, if it is Chaplin, Braylon, Caden, uh, Schick, and Clements, I mean, that you know, you're potentially entering a second year in a row with that same exact group, they're all on the same page, all on the same wavelength. And I just wonder if you move Caden Moore around, I mean, he's the guy who's played that position the longest, does that mess up any communication or anything at all? I mean, this like, you know, if Aeneas Peoples is praising this group that much, um, you know, maybe he's just being a nice teammate. But <laughs> if, if the comments are true, it's like, okay, well, if you have a pretty good thing going, I don't know if I'd want to mess with it too much. So, yeah, I think, I think it'll be interesting to see. Um, obviously, Braylon's probably the guy who's going to take over at, at center for Caden more. Um, but Caden, I mean, he, uh, he's he been pretty consistent at that spot. Uh, um, but at the same time, I think it's all about getting your best five offensive linemen on the field. So if you can do that by moving guys around and getting Lath Ganim in there, and um, then I think that's what you got to do. So it, it'll be interesting to see. You know, we'll get to watch practice, I think, on Friday and on on next Wednesday um, before week one begins. And it'll be interesting to see what what those what that situation is like and if they continue to move guys around or if it was just a Vance Vice Day, like Chris said. Quickly, before we move on from the offensive line here, uh, Andy, you had the opportunity as well as Nick and myself to uh, play against the 
all-star second baseman Bob Schick uh, in some church league softball yeah. this summer. <laughs> I think they crushed us in that game too. It was not. We played him twice. Did we play him twice? We, we got I, beat in the playoffs. Oh, I missed the second one. Yeah, oh, okay, I, I, I got Bob Schick out. I got Schick no out. No wonder we lost in the playoffs. I was gone the second time. No. Yeah, there. One, yeah, well, Schick grounded out to me at first one one game. That's right. Um, he's he's a big guy, and that that team is like very <laughs> underrated. I didn't recognize him at first. I'm just like, who is this behemoth that's up there at the plate that's coming <laughs> against us? And they got to second place. I'm like, oh, that's Bob Schick. That, that's why. That's He's an enormous human being. That's the, why. The bat looked uh, miniature uh, <laughs> in his hands. And uh, I will say, great offensive lineman. Second base could use a little bit of work. But uh, but I think all of us struggle in that I league. I was going to say, I don't, think, I don't think anybody on our team should be throwing stones about no. <laughs> the fielding accomplishments. We didn't win a single game. Not true. We won no, one. We won, won one. We won, won the opener. We won you one. You didn't let me finish after the season opener. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't bury the lead there. We were we were we were well, tied Gio, for first place. You know, after the first we, you want to talk about how our season ended? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll let somebody else tell that story. <laughs> uh, long story short, uh, Geo just decided to full send it home. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! You have to set the table with the are, best hit. That I had all season, yeah, cranking a, a, triple a triple into the left center gap. And then everybody's telling Gio to stop at third base, and Gio just blew by the signal and went home two outs. He got tagged out like five feet before. Oh, he was game of the season, can't hold anything back now. Yeah. So, yeah. Listen, our season ended. Listen, you can set it up as this. Our season ended on a two-run scoring triple. <laughs> Boom. Just leave it there. That's a good way to go. At least you didn't try to Pete Rose the catcher, and that would have been like a, 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 a black mark on the season and a bad way to end Why it. not? Our photographer has 86 career red cards in the local <laughs> so soccer true. rec league. Mm. So that's nothing wrong with some physical play. Now we got to get Chris to join the – everybody in this room would, except would, Chris I would, lie, I would Yeah, I would, my best friend, like – playing in the local rec softball league like shattered his leg like compound fracture one time bone sticking out of his what did leg. he slide yes okay well we none Don't of us slide. slide who's sliding in a rec if softball you're gonna league? play you need to play hard that's <laughs> why y'all lose dude we play <laughs> hard without sliding <laughs> no, no there's no such thing you literally can't play hard unless you're sliding first of all you do you just <laughs> overrun the bag i did that a bunch too <laughs> first of all nobody plays Which hard nick, in rec nick softball did, come on nick's done that before <laughs> hey if you're running hard you just blow right by the bag uh let's reel it back in here talk about the tight ends um the tight end group the one big loss like andy had alluded to uh, in the transfer portal was daquan right first and foremost how are we going to fill that role uh and, and it, it doesn't seem like it's going to be that difficult to do but but who's going to do it well you've got three guys with experience there now you got gallo um you got gosnell you got saint germain gallo's got plenty of experience I think everybody was impressed with Gosnell last year. If he can just stay healthy, I think for an extended period of time, I think he could rapidly develop and be a very good player. Uh, caught a touchdown pass in the bowl game, and so did St. Saint- Germain, right? Both both the tight ends caught touchdown passes. So I think Tech is fine in that position. Um, it, it's one of those things where Daquan Wright was going to leave, and, and you have your allotment, and you've got to spread it around. And you're like, well, we got four tight ends who can play, so – we need to make sure we keep uh, some guys at other positions where we maybe don't quite have as much depth. So that, that's that's the type of uh, decisions you have to make as a head coach these days and allocating your L- NIL money. But uh, I think Virginia Tech will be fine at tight end. The question is like how many tight, how many, how does what formations are they going to use? Because you bring back Ollie Jennings, so you're going to have one extra receiver. It feels like at any point where Virginia Tech doesn't have three wide receivers on the field, it's going to seem like kind of a waste, right? But when you've got three receivers out there, you know, you're limited with what you do with, with your tight ends. Sure. So uh, I think, you know, some good problems to have. Yeah, I think that's part of the reason, you know, a lot of Daquan's contributions were as a receiver. Mm-hmm. And he played, you know, played in the slot quite a bit in his freshman year when he came on late in the year. So uh, I think losing him, you can make up for that with the number of receivers and the, the variety of receivers that you have, especially in the slot. Um, you know, as far as a starter here at tight end, I think it's going to be Gosnell. Uh, 
just based on, I think Gallo is still working his way back from the injury and, and shaking off the rust from that whole thing. I think they're excited about Gosnell and what he, he brings to the table. And you look at Gallo's history, it's not like he was ever this huge pass catcher. Right. I think it was 20 some catches was the most he ever had in a career or in a season. So, uh, I would not expect all of a sudden to have like an 80 catch tight end or something like that out of this group, but they, they need guys that go in there and they do the dirty work and they block and every now and then they're open down the field for a pass. But uh, it, it seems like a solid enough crew for me. I don't know if you need like a superstar at tight end. I think they have some pretty good players though. I mean, Gosnell and Harrison St. Germain both caught touchdown passes in the military bowl. I mean, it's not like these guys are unproven you know, they've proven they're, they're able to do it in the game. So that's a pretty deep room. Um, especially when you get Nick Gallo back. Benji played 426 snaps last year. Harrison St. Germain played just 107 snaps. Uh, You kind of answered my question, where does Nick Gallo fit into this room? So last one on the tight ends. Anybody else beyond those three that could kind of get onto the field? Because that was kind of where Harrison St. Germain was hanging out last year. I don't think so. I just don't think there's not enough snaps to go around. In fact, even a guy like St. Germain, maybe not, might, might not get as many snaps as he did last year because Ali Jennings is back. Yep. Right? Um, so you're not going to be using a tight end in the slot sometimes like occasionally you did last year. Um, the return of Ali Jennings and also, and again, we'll talk about this later or we can get into it now or whatever, but uh, just Aiden Green making advancements. It's gonna like it's like Tech's going to have two extra receivers this year. So how do the reps get split up? And that impacts other positions such as tight end as well. We're going to get there in just a second because we're bringing up the bad boys. We're talking about this wide receiver group, arguably the deepest and most talented position group on the entire roster. Want to go guy by guy here. Jalen Lane, we're going to start with him. He's the highest graded returner, 41 catches, 538 yards, six touchdowns. We kind of, me and Nick were were talking about it yesterday, and they did a really cool film breakdown. Um, Actually, it was Eddie Royal and Kyron Drones. And the way that they were breaking down some of the biggest plays of the season, Eddie Royal was just alluding to that that Jalen Lane's kind of an RPO menace because a lot of the times he was breaking off those big ones or when Kyron would get the safety to come down, hit Jalen Lane on the slant, and then boom, he's just so fast. He runs past everyone. I remember being at a wedding in Charleston, South Carolina for the Wake Forest game this past year, and a bunch of us were tech grads. So we're sitting there in the van going from the wedding to the reception, and we're keeping up with the with the game on our phones. And he, how long was that touchdown pass? 70 yards, 60 yards, something Between like that. 60 By the way, that's a crime to have a wedding on a Virginia Tech football game day if you're uh, a Hokie. Uh, I don't know, man. I'm anti-fall uh, weddings. Schedule personally. your wedding when you want to have your wedding. Yeah, exactly. Fair. People exactly. are going a little. People are going a little bit too nuts with this. Uh, never do it on a fall, a fall Saturday. What are you doing? I mean, I'd like, honestly, you I'll know what? Re- don't come to my wedding. Uh, if, you're, if you're that diehard of a it fan, was 75 you have to yards. Go tailgate. I, I, like my 75. So I'd, I'd rather. It be, was the first play of the drive. That's right. I'd rather be in Charleston in October than Charleston in June or July. To be honest with you, and it was, it was great weather. But anyway, so we're we're sitting there keeping up with that play, 75 yard touchdown, and I'm like, that had to have been an RPO slant over the middle and then you know you watch the replay sure enough it was um i think there were times last year where he was a dominant player and times where they kind of got away from him to a certain extent but virginia tech was such a run heavy team last year that that's going to happen um i mean just you look at the la- that last game of the season against uva and i want to say the receivers only caught three or four passes in that game um, to be fair, Lane had like a 70-yard touchdown wiped out by a bogus penalty, right. a holding penalty on right. that play. He right. had two touchdowns in two weeks wiped out. That's he right. He did. He right. came back. Yeah. There was a legitimate penalty on that one. Right. But, uh, and Gosnell scored a touchdown in that game. But there's just there, there's there's more players than there are going to be a bunch of like I don't th- I don't know that anybody on this team will catch 50 passes. And I know that's hard. Like so, Jalen Lane caught like I want to say 60 some passes at Middle Tennessee, and then he comes here and his numbers drop to 41 catches. And you know, Ali Jennings was catching. I think I think he caught 69 one year at ODU. I don't know that he'll catch 50 because it's just a different offense, and there's so many of them. His but, final year at ODU, he caught 54 passes. But he passes. played nine games because he right. was injured. The year before that, he caught 68. 68 yeah. passes and had 1,000 yards receiving. I he did. He had 1,000 yards his second to last year and then 959 uh, in a shortened season and, his final year. And he was like their only good player. Yeah. So uh, I think it's going to be hard for anybody, on any receiver on this offense to put up 
like good numbers and be an all ACC player at the end of the year because Tech's going to run it so much. But as a group, they're going to be very good. Isn't that what you want, though? Yeah, the yeah. Complete yeah. balance, yeah, the sure. ability to have threats across the board. Because if you've just got one or two, and there's an injury. Your goose is pretty much cooked, so yeah. to speak, right? <laughs> That's sure. what you want as long as you have receivers that can handle that. Sure. Now, you know, if you have a Stefan Diggs-like player in your receiving core, that if somebody else catches a touchdown and you come over the sideline and he starts yelling at the quarterback because he didn't throw it to him. Right. Uh, that's a problem. <laughs> Stephon Diggs has done that with the Vikings and with the Bills, and he'll do it with the Texans this year. Uh, th- Good there's Sometimes there's just an attitude like that with those players. It's like, oh, even if the team's having success, how come I'm not having that success? And I don't see that in this receiver group. Now, who knows? We'll get to the season, and maybe uh, there will be some grumbles about, uh, you know, passes, the, the share of passes that come their direction. But I, I don't see that right now. That's It seems like a very healthy room and, uh, you know, sort of this spirit of camaraderie with everybody that they're not really worried about their stats too much. So that, that's a, a refreshing outlook for that group. There's also like, I think you, they're in a situation where they have to be good teammates. And I think they're all, they're all naturally good teammates, but they kind of have to be because it's such a deep group that if, if, you make an ass out of yourself, so to speak. You just get benched, and they're going to just put the next guy in because there's a lot of depth, right? Sure. Uh, I think back to what Fontel Mind said about Aiden Green when they had their one-on-one conversation. Aiden Green was like, basically, I want these guys to come back. I want to learn from them. He's a guy who's going to play a lot this year. And, I, and Gio, you talked about just the depth overall. I mean, Andy wrote a really good article on the receivers recently. Two of the guys – he mentioned in there to Kai Heath, a guy who had a lot of promise last year. He's a gadget guy as is Xavier Turner Bradshaw. Both of those guys made plays, whether, you know, or Xavier Turner Bradshaw made plays to Kai Heath was supposed to be in that, uh, in that kind of role. Um, but they had both are highly spoken of by the staff. And then you've got some of these guys like Keelan Adams and Chance Wiggins coming in, right? Like it's, it's an interesting thing because, I don't. I couldn't tell you the last. I mean, I couldn't tell you the last time Virginia Tech had a a wide receiver room where you could go six, seven guys deep and and feel comfortable that those guys were going to catch passes and be able to produce. You don't remember the last time you felt that way because it's never happened before. Yeah, I mean that. Right. I mean, the, the, I, like, the think, deepest they've ever gone was five. I mean, yeah, those mid two thousand. Yeah, the two thousand seven right. room was, right. was very deep, but. It's it's interesting. Like Fontel Mind is gonna have to make some tough decisions on who plays and who doesn't. Yeah, let's talk about Heath. You know, when, when I wrote, when I interviewed interviewed players during media day, I always ask them, you know, name a young player on each side of the ball that hasn't played yet that you think is gonna be really good, basically. And uh, a bunch of them said Heath this year, and a few of them said Chance Wiggins as well, the true freshman receiver. I just can't see how Wiggins gets on the field. I, 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 agreed, absolutely. And nobody said and, Brody. Uh, nobody said uh, Keelan Adams, the twenty third best receiver according to ESPN in the class. That, nope. that's surprising. Nope. Um, I mean, I mean, well, Wiggins was a four star guy too. Yeah, not, not as highly decorated, but but still highly thought of. But apparently has a, just a great catch radius. Is what I think it was Keonta Jenkins who said. Uh, you don't have to necessarily put it you know, in a tiny little box because his catch radius is so wide. But um, Heath is a guy who would actually wouldn't surprise me if he passed uh, Turner Bradshaw as, as the backup slot receiver this year. Um, I, he wasn't a highly recruited guy because of his size, but again, Highland Springs, he was so well coached. So he was going to play last year if he hadn't gotten hurt. Um, when he, he got hurt against Rutgers on, on his first, first, on his on his first, first play snap. of his career. He broke his wrist oh on my his first, God. first snap he played in that, college. That, that's, that's bad luck. But, it, uh, in the th- I mean, that was game three, three. of the season, yeah. and they had decided at that point that he was going to have a role on this team. They were yeah. going to burn his red shirt last year, and obviously they changed their plans after he got injured. But you know that tells you kind of the, some of the confidence the staff had mm-hmm. on him, that they go, this guy's going to have enough of a role going forward that we're going to burn his red shirt this early. Exactly. So... Uh, I think you will see him some in the slot this year. How much? I don't know because, you know, you've got Jalen Lane. <laughs> you've got Aiden Green uh, who can play on the outside or in the slot. I want to say about 20% of his snaps came in the slot last year. And and then you're going to have some two tight end formations where you don't have a slot receiver. But uh, 
he's going to be on the field at some point, in my opinion. I mean, this is the epitome of an embarrassment of riches here with the Virginia Tech wide receiver room. Uh, Wanted to just touch on Quan Felton, 38 catches, 667 yards, eight touchdowns. He's kind of your deep threat guy. He's probably the, your freakiest yeah. guy in terms of size. He, the he's the one that looks like an NFL receiver, yeah. possibly. Yeah, yeah he's, he's got that body. Um, and it's, it's so interesting that he started his career. Was it Norfolk State? Yeah, Norfolk yeah, State. Yeah, Norfolk yep. State. Like, how in the world did that guy slip through the cracks? Right. I forget the exact story behind his background. I don't think he did a bunch of camps yeah. or anything like that. So yeah. Maybe it was fairly new to fo- I, I can't remember the exact story on it. Somebody will correct me yeah, on that. I'm yeah, sure, it's, 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 it's really odd. It does happen. It does. Occasionally. Yeah. Occasionally it does. It used to happen a lot. Now well, it rarely happens. Well, the funny thing is, Virginia I, Tech I think Tootin, like, I remember talking to Stu Holt about how, how Bay shall Tootin fall through the cracks in North Carolina and T. And that, we also have to <laughs> that remember, was COVID year. That was, that's COVID, so... Well, um, it might have been the same for yeah, Felton. Felton. Could very well have been. Yeah. yeah. But he's, Felton is, <clears throat> I forget what the quote was, for, and I don't, I forget who said it, but somebody said something along the lines of, like, Felton is, like, like a guy that tall and that big should not be able to run that he's fast. so fast. Kalen Lane I, said that. Yeah. yeah. I, okay, and I, I want to also talk about now the talent in Virginia Tech's coaching room at wide receiver. Because as much props as we give Fontel Mines, he may only be the second best wide receiver coach on the staff. Gunter Brewer has coached two Bolitnikoff winners and a Bolitnikoff finalist. And you got Cam Phillips, who has records held who's, here, who's, who's the helping them coach. out. I mean, right. they, they talked about what it was like to learn from him and, and watching some of his old film and stuff. I mean, you're right. That might be the most wealthy, so to speak, uh, coaching room. Yes. I don't know. In terms of just coaching, I don't know that there's a group of wide receivers anywhere in the country that has more resources to fall back on than Virginia Tech's receivers. And they engineered that that sick uh, jug machine that they showed on that ACC kickoff. That is a that is a Virginia Tech-only thing, I was told, uh, that they made here at the engineering school. Think about how far this receiving room, just in terms of personnel and coaches, has come from that pinstripe bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Texas eighth, re- Tex eighth receiver right now would be starting in Do you that know who the leading bowl. receiver in that pinstripe bowl was? Was it that walk on? Uh, what, what was, was his it? name? It was it was a pay you? Uh, most receptions <laughs> by a receiver in that game was a walk on Luke Bustle. That's it. Wow. Who eventually moved to, moved safety, to safety, I think. Yes. Two, two for 27. Yes, that's, that's who I was Leading about. pass catcher in that game in terms of yardage was Jaden Payute. Payute. That's what I saw. One wow. catch for 42 yards. Was that the only catch of his the career? The only catch of his career because <laughs> he, he medically retired the next year. And that was a guy who was like number four player in the state. Yeah, he, he was supposed to be big. So much promise that, you know, he jumps in the back of a truck bed. <laughs> like that was that was like his career highlight turned out just because he was injured all the time. Just couldn't get over the, the leg injuries that kind of, uh, you know, cut him down. But I mean... Jaden Payute and Luke Bussell were the only wide receivers who caught passes. And who was throwing them the ball? Blumrick. That was Connor Blumrick. I mean, what a day. Think (laughs) about that. I I know, like, you know, Tavion Robinson transferred before that game, and Trey Turner opted out of that game. But I mean, the, the receiver room. Was in such a bad place, and then the next year, because Caleb Smith was hurt at the end of that year, and the next oh, year yeah. Caleb Smith's your number one guy, and then Daywan Lofton, I guess, is your number two. Like to go from that to where they are now, I mean, there's a reason why Fontel Mines keeps getting promoted, and they keep giving him more money. It's because he's doing just a bang up job in that room. Yep. I went to that game. That was why, because uh, I, I, I was like, "Ooh, I'm from New York." You know, looking back, <laughs> looking back in hindsight, I. I don't know how anybody could have like reasonably thought Virginia Tech could be competitive uh, in that game. I just wanted to go to Yankee Stadium. I had never been. Mm-hmm. I've and told you guys, like Mike Nislik and I saw the the practice they did up at uh, I forget the like Fordham or something like whatever the university was that they were doing Col- that at Columbia. Col- was it Columbia? I forget. Uh, we saw an offensive period where they they ran the offense defense and they didn't complete a pass for like ten minutes. <laughs> it was just dreadful watching them doing that we're like this this is going to be a blow and like sports betting was not legal in new york but it was in new jersey we're taking the, the uber ride back <laughs> oh, to the hotel Lord. now ethically i will not bet on the team that i'm covering i don't want to have that sort of conflict of interest going sure. on but for a second there we're like should we pop over to new jersey real quick <laughs> maybe just put some money on maryland in this game because we i think we saw that and we're like this is going to be ugly this is and 
yeah, it was an ugly result. Yeah, no, nothing was worse uh, in that than than they're interviewing the new head coach. They're interviewing Brent Pry, one of the first times the fan bases is hearing from him. And he's like, "We're gonna pride ourselves on outstanding defense." And then Talia Tungavailoa rips one for like seventy five yards, yeah. yards right behind it's him. Like, we're and- gonna get back to playing lunch pail defense. Like, oh, here's another. It's a thirty point game with a seventy yard touchdown. And the bro- I don't remember who was calling play by play, but they like almost cut coach off a little bit and they're like oh there's a 75 yarder yeah so let me get this straight you thought it'd be like fun to get it's like hey there's this cold weather bowl game with a shell of a team and an interim coach during a covid surge you know you let can go to go Yankee go stadium, stadium in June. For, I, <laughs> let me go to this I, game I, at a baseball stadium i i was a, a f- wide-eyed freshman who was just eager to watch the Hokies play and i like i haven't got it was COVID in new york yet. let's see if i can do that one of my <laughs> one of my roommates yeah that too one of my roommates uh at the time was from jersey so we stayed at his place it was a big group it was fun cuz we did the whole rockefeller center during christmas time and whatnot and you know. i mean you lose a little bit of the new york luster when there were like covid testing yes. stations on every corner yeah <laughs> like i don't know why they put those in times square like let's put it in the most populous <laughs> area of new york city it was, it was such a bizarre trip i've only Start been to, to new finish. york city twice in my life and that was one of them it was it's that's it's, it's weird very weird getting back to the wide receivers here uh ollie jennings we've talked about him he's finally back I mean, he's, he's got to be, you'd have to think, he's wide receiver one. No? Is, is that how this shapes out, or does that go to Quan Felton or maybe Jalen Lane, or is Ali WR1? I don't know if there's a designation I necessarily. Yeah. I mean, I, that was a thought last year when, you know, Lane coming in from where he came in in Middle Tennessee, pretty good production, but you kind of look at him as a slot guy, and Felton, you know, hadn't produced like he did last year and really came on strong at the end of last year, was their, their best receiver. But... um yeah, you know, I look at it as a trio or a quartet of guys there at the top. I don't know if there's a number one guy necessarily out of that group, but you know, Jennings sounds like he's primed for a big season. You know, he dropped a bunch of weight from the spring. He couldn't really run a lot in the offseason when he's coming back from that injury. And um, you know, I think he feels lighter, he feels faster, he feels healthy for the first time in a long time. And you know, all that's you know, in to to one package that I, I think he's gonna have a pretty good season. Okay. The, kind, the kind of season I thought they I think they hope they get out of him last year. I, I think so, and it looked like he was going to have that type of season after the first game, and then, you know, unfortunately he had that broken leg. I think that's your top three, you know, Felton and Jennings on the outside and Lane in the slot, and behind them you've got two very capable guys of, of Gosnell and um, oh, Aiden Green, Green, of course. Uh, and then how do you fit Heath and, and right. Turner Bradshaw TB, there? Yeah. But, you know, as far as that first three, if you're in a three wide receiver formation, those are your three guys. And who your number one is this can vary week to week depending on matchups and the opponent. Yeah. Um, I do. I would suspect that at the end of the season, Jennings will have the most catches. But So so I guess to, to tailor my question a little bit, who is going to draw the opposing <laughs> team's best corner? Well, these days, a lot of teams just play left and right corner. There's not as much mix, mix and match as there used to be because – of, uh, you know, there's just not the whole let's huddle and go walk up to the offensive line slowly and then the cornerbacks have time to change sides of the field and things like that. The teams get up to the line of scrimmage quickly these days and you don't know when they're going to snap it. That's why, I mean, Tech used to play their their defensive ends weren't left and right defensive ends. They were uh, the stud end and then the regular end and they were boundary and wide side and and they move all over the field based on that, and it's harder to do that these days. Um, so I, you, even for the most part, Tech doesn't do doesn't put Dorian Strong on the other team's best receiver. They generally play it left or right. Um, I, who draws the most attention? Then I, I think that's part of the the beauty of this receiving core is that you know pick your poison. I sure. don't basically I, like okay, you want to go. Heavy focus on Ollie Jennings, Jalen Lane, and Daquan Felt will hurt you in the receiving game. Yeah, you know, you pick a different receiver, and that opens up Jennings to do some things. So I, I think that's why there's so much excitement about this group. Is that you know in the in the past you go well, if you cover Trey Turner, who's going to make a play for this team? You know, if you cover uh, some other receiver, who's going to make a play? And uh, you know, typically you have two guys maybe that can make plays. It's it's a pretty deep group that you know. I'd like to see some four wide formations. I know that they're awesome. they're a run first team, but I think they have the personnel to be able to do that this mm-hmm. year uh, on occasion. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing is once you throw in 
RPOs and, and whatnot, and you get to the point where you got Kyron Jones and Basil Tootin in the running game, like defenses have to be on their toes across the board. Like this Virginia Tech team can't be easy for opposing defensive coordinators to prepare for. The the one guy I think that stands out to me maybe the most in that room that's not, you know, like obviously Jennings and Lane and Felton are all are, are gonna get a lot of attention. And I think part of that depends like it'll probably be Felton and, and Jennings, my guess I get most of the attention because Lane a lot of times is in the slot. Those guys are the outside receivers. Um but I think Stephen Costnell is crucial to this this group. I mean, this is a guy who tore his ACL in the military bowl and is wearing blue and uh, non-contact in practice right now, but he's anything but non-contact. I, like, he's flying around and he's on the ground every single practice. He's a guy, Andy wrote in his story, he had 22 receptions last year. 16 of them, 73%, went for first downs. He's a reliable guy who you can kind of fit in any that, that kind of fits in anywhere. So I think they've got like the right mix of inside guys, outside guys, old guys, young guys. It's kind of just how do you want to attack certain defenses? And Tyler Bowen has a lot. I mean, you throw in again drones and Tootin. He's got a lot of weapons um, at his disposal, and I think you know I, I'm. I think the thing, one of the things that everybody will have their eye on in that uh, that opener against Vanderbilt is, what does a wide receiver snaps look like? Like, you know, is it how does it how does it stagger and um, who's playing with who and what formations is Tech using to get the best players on the field? But there are a lot of them. Do you think Stephen Gosnell hundred percent ready to roll uh, against Vanderbilt a couple of weeks from now? Well, I've seen him in practice. He's bouncing around like somebody who looks hundred percent to me. So they're just kind of being a little little cautious, not letting him get that, hit for the time being. Sure. Probably, I think so. If you're eight months removed from a ACL, uh, but you know, Fontel Mons calls, calls him the glue guy of the receiving room, and I, you know, he's he was here a year before all those other transfers were, so he went through that rough season in 2022 and some injuries in that season, concussions. I mean, shoot, he had concussed like three times in one play against North Carolina. It seemed, it seemed like they were going after him <laughs> specifically. Well, he went his from, came from there. Yeah. Play. yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> so that was a rough uh, year for him, but, and then to end it like it did last season. But I mean, I, he, he's a guy that's pretty reliable in this, in this receiving core. And uh, you know, he's not a big boastful guy, so you don't hear about him a whole lot, but like it, he, he makes first down catches. I and mean, those are important. Do you, alive. do you remember what Scott Leffler called Willie Byrne? Paper boy, the paper boy. Always delivers. Always delivers. Yeah, right. Geo, do you even know what a paper boy is? Are you old enough? <laughs> I, I was once in the musical Newsies, so of course okay. I know what a paper. Fair. Back in my high school okay. theater days, they yeah. actually had a Nintendo game when I was a kid called Paper Boy. <laughs> yeah, you had delivered. to like throw it through windows. Exactly. Like yeah. That. It was avoid very, it was avoid those game. grates on the, the yeah. street. Yep. Uh, yeah, Willie Byrne. That was in the the era where. They relied on walk-ons quite a right, bit. Right, right. Remember and one what? year Charlie Meyer was going to be like the guy. Yeah. And, he, and he got hurt. He had like a hamstring. Yeah. Like I had a whole story ready to go on Charlie Meyer, and he's a walk-on. I could have gone to Navy or something like that. Then he like injured his hamstring in the preseason. It was never heard from ne- again. Never heard from again. So that's yep. and, strange. Uh, and Byrne was a good player. Like he caught a lot of passes for Tech. Uh, uh, because, and he played in the slot. And that was back when Tech didn't have like a specialty slot receiver. They had never done that before. Um, under the previous offensive staff. So it was like, oh, my gosh, we have a slot receiver now. And he was perfect for it. Um, We're talking about the 2010s now, too. Like, it's, know, it's not I like know. ancient history. Like, slot receivers have been around for a while. Exactly. <laughs> but it took Virginia Tech a while to catch up, not surprisingly. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of who Gosnell reminds me of. He's bigger than Byrne, of course, but he always seems to be open. I guess, you know, and then he just he comes through for you and uh, just a good, solid player overall. Very good in the run game, too. Good blocker. I mean, Chris, you and I talked about this this last podcast. Third down and five, Kyron's scrambling around. Who does he get the ball to for that mm-hmm. first down catch? It, it most of the time was Gosnell right. uh, in those scramble situations, particularly. Uh, he, he he finds a way to get open. Yeah, and he's I reliable. Think, I think a lot of times, Gio, you talked about who's going to get the most attention. I think if you put four wide receivers on the field, Gosnell's probably going to get the least, least amount of attention. But yeah. he's Mr. Reliable. So th- that, I mean, that's a nice guy to just 
have in your repertoire a glue guy like like Andy said. This is great. I feel giddy. I cannot wait to watch some Virginia Tech football. Let's roll on here. As always, Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. As our presenting sponsor, First Bank and Trust Company's support Tech. has been invaluable to TSL, helping us to bring you all the great content across all of our platforms. They offer a variety of checking and saving account options that are sure to meet your banking needs, including free checking. Visit firstbank.com to find the account that's right for you. Let's roll on to the running backs, shall we? First and foremost, Bayshel Tuin, 175 rushes for 875 yards, 10 touchdowns, uh, 27 catches, 239 yards, two touchdowns. He was very dangerous, catching balls out of the backfield as well. Uh, his PFF grades ranked 10th amongst ACC running backs that played over 100 snaps last season. First in the ACC in broken tackle percentage. First in the ACC in force missed tackles. And second in the ACC in yards after contact. I mean, two wins yeah. back, and, and he's a beast. The, the, yeah, exactly. And because of that, like that doesn't really match up with the, with the overall grade, does it? Um, right. Uh, things were so rough early in the season that uh, I think it was tough for him to get a positive grade because there was no room at all um, for him to run. But, man, 69 force missed tackles and 175 carries, I believe is the number. Because I'm writing a running back sort of. Yeah, I think he was second to Amari and Hampton yeah. in the ACC. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, we got, on a lot fewer carries. Yeah, give him some blocks. And right. He's a 1,000-yard runner. Right. Imagine if he wasn't had, didn't have to, like, break the tackles of defensive ends and he can, all the time. And he, he'd go one-on-one -on -one with safeties more. I mean, remember what happened to Virginia Tech in the Purdue game? Oh, yeah, yeah. Tech had, like. Five rushing yards. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, only because Kyron had a late game scramble to get them back. Yeah. Well, I, I, the I remember. And, and I remember the yards. ODU game when uh, he had what I don't know, seventeen or eighteen carries, but only averaged like two point eight yards per carry. But, but he, I think he had eleven force <laughs> missed tackles on yeah. like eighteen carries or something. It was incredible, and uh, you could tell he was good, but you could also tell his blocking was horrible. Um, but I think. They're in a much better spot this year. I think if they had run the offense that they settled on last year, the whole year, he would have been a thousand yard rusher. And you'd have a thousand yard rusher returning. And I think I think he can and probably will be a thousand yard rusher this year. Does five fumbles worry you at all last year? Did drop a couple. I mean, ten touchdowns to five fumbles, not the best ratio in the world. Yeah, it, it does. It does. But Sometimes fumbles can be random too. Right? Sure, like you, you could go a guy could go a year with hardly fumbling at all, and then he could have a, a decent number in a in a, in, in a short, quick span after that. I'm also, I remember what Lee Suggs went like two years without fumbling, and then I want to say like his last year he had like two or three, and everybody's like, "Oh my God, what's wrong?" Right. <laughs> But so sometimes it can be streaky. Like I'm, that. I'm curious if how many of those, and I'm going to look it up on the spot here, how many of those, I almost feel like there was like two in the military bowl, which would obviously lopside things a little bit. Yes. Remember how disgusting it was two that in the, day. Two in the military bowl, yeah. So that doesn't count. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, Tech fumbled. Kyron had three fumbles. <laughs> Jalen yeah, I mean. Lane fumbled once. Two and had one fumble in the military bowl. So Yeah, um, that wouldn't count anything in that slot. No, no, yeah. absolutely not. Uh, Gio, I think the most interesting thing about this running back group is there's clearly talent there with Tootin. It's can Virginia Tech be consistent enough running the ball? I think back to that Marshall game last year. Virginia Tech was averaging like six and a half yards a carry. Kyron Drones, I believe on like the first drive of the game. He had like a 35-yard run. It was the longest run to date of the season for Virginia Tech through four games. Tech's averaging like six and a half yards a carry and just stops running the ball. It's like, obviously, we saw how Virginia Tech ran the ball down the stretch, pick game and on. If the Hokies are, are running the ball like that and they're consistent about it and they're methodical and they don't shy away from it, like they stick to their guns. You can't... I thought there were too many times early in the year where Tech just got way too off track. It's like, if you want to be a run-first team, you, you have to run the ball. Mm -hmm. And I, like that Purdue game, Tech could not do anything. And then <laughs> you look at the, the military bowl and Tech setting bowl game rushing records. It's he like, had eight carries for four yards against Purdue, yeah. I believe. It's it's night and day. And, and I think... Having we, we we really saw Kyron come out of his shell in terms of being able to run the ball, 
him, I mean, between him and Tootin, like that is, that is just another level of what defenses have to game plan for. You've essentially got, you you mentioned Georgia Tech earlier, Chris, and they've got uh, kind of a similar situation where they've got two guys and a quarterback and a running back that could potentially go for a thousand yards each this Mm -hmm. year on the ground. So a lot of talent in that run game, kind of just how Tech uses it and implements it. Let's talk about RB2. Malachi Thomas, 82 rushes, 374 yards, two tuds a season to go. He's actually the fifth highest graded player on the offense last year (laughs) overall for Virginia Tech. How does he fit into the rotation this season? I mean, obviously he's running back too, but but what do the carry numbers look like for Malachi Thomas, and what does he Uh, offer in contrast to Tubin? That's a good question. That's a topic in my article that that will be posted later today or was posted earlier today depending on what time you're watching this video <laughs> um he had he keeps getting bigger he's up to 215 now and it looks like a legit 215 uh his forced missed tackle rate was the by far the highest of his career last year as he added more size and i would expect it to get a little bit better this year he's always been more of a vision guy than than a guy who's going to make people miss or break through tackles but that part of his game has improved but again it's 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 some of this is you want to get your receivers the ball because you've got two extra receivers this year. So do you pass the ball more? And in which case, if you do, like, who has fewer carries, right? Is it going to be Tootin? Is it going to be Drones? Is it going I to mean, be Thomas? I, I don't know. You'd um, like Drones to have less carries to keep them healthy. Ideally. Ideally. Um, but at the same time, in certain games, you're going to have to do what you have to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so... I think Malachi Thomas is going to have probably his most efficient year for Virginia Tech. I don't know what that's going to mean from a number standpoint. It's, I mean, last year was around two to one mm-hmm. for you know, Tootin carries to Thomas carries. That's probably about right. Yeah, from I your think started so. to your backup. I, I think uh, it's like a two series, one series type thing, typically with running backs, or at least when you have a clear number one guy. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if that was the breakdown again. And you know, they're not especially deep at running back. Um, then again, they had ten running backs like two years ago, so that's, that's what we're comparing and they still it to. Still weren't deep. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if you necessarily have to have this huge roster of running backs because uh, typically you're not getting to your third or fourth guys all that much anyway. If everybody stays healthy, if they don't, then that's a different story altogether. But uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty good one-two punch there. They have the question mark is if one of those guys gets hurt, who's the third guy? Because the start of practice, it was Prelo. Who, who was a walk-on. He had a really good spring game. I think he's a talented player. Two touchdowns right, in the spring yeah, exactly. game. Right, uh, exactly. I think he'd be like a great FCS player. He's a little bit small. He's gotten bigger, but he's up to 180 now. Um, but he's still not the biggest guy in the world. Uh, and behind, behind him are freshmen. And, you know, I think prize high on Jeremiah Coney, but he's still only a redshirt freshman. And if you look in the past, even guys like Lee Suggs were – third string is redshirt freshman. They weren't quite ready for the limelight. And behind that is Tyler Mason, who's a true freshman, who played at the lowest classification in North Carolina football. It's a big adjustment coming to ACC level football from that. So he's most likely going to have to redshirt. Um, So hopefully those top two guys can stay healthy. I do think there would be a drop off to to the third guy. Uh, It'll be interesting for me to see what happens after the season when Tootin is gone. Will Tech hit the portal for another running back. Right now, my guess would be yes. I think almost certainly yeah. they would, just to, to bulk up the depth in that room, if anything. Yeah. But they'd probably be looking for a start or two, I would imagine. Let's talk about the quarterbacks. We've had a riveting quarterback battle. No. <laughs> it, I, Chris, I want to ask you, and, and Andy, and honestly all three of you, because David grew up a huge Tech fan, of course. I mean, how refreshing is it to go into this season and quarterback isn't even a thought other than you got a great one. Yeah, right. Uh, exactly. And um, what's refreshing to me is knock on wood, because I thought we had this last year too, um, but you're going to have the same starter for the second year in a row for the first time in a long time. I feel like I've you know, been sitting here saying or writing for the last decade, well, at least Virginia Tech is going to have the same quarterback for the second year in a row for the first time since however many years, and then it doesn't happen for whatever reasons, um, whether there's an injury, whether it's COVID, whatever. Um, hopefully it happens this year. It looks like it's going to. <laughs> so uh, the good thing news is even if it didn't happen, 
Like, you wouldn't have to drastically change your offense for Colin Schley. He's very similar to Drones and what he can do physically. In fact, his, his numbers indicate he's actually a better runner than Drones. And, Interesting. And pretty much the same number of carries in college as his, his yards per carry is, is higher. His, his, his lo- he has longer runs, uh, probably a little bit more explosive. Um, but uh, that's what I like about it, is if something did happen to Drones, you wouldn't have to, like, drastically the alter like you did office. last year. Right. You had to change everything. Exactly. And it yeah. worked for the better. Right. Here's a trivia question I'd like to throw out. Who's the last Hokies quarterback to start at least eight games in back to back seasons? <laughs> um, probably Brewer. Uh, I don't know. Probably Brewer. I don't think he did his, his sophomore. Brewer did not get huh? there the second uh, year because he had the, in, the collarbone injury. injuries. He only had so Thomas was the same Logan, quarterback. Logan, as, Logan Thomas. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Logan Thomas is uh, at the end of his NFL career right, right. at this point. I mean, that, it's a long time ago. We're talking about, uh, you know, 2012 and 13 were the mm-hmm. two years, right? Yep. 2011, yeah, that, 12, 13 correct. was when he was yep. the starter. So uh, it has been a minute since they've had any continuity there. And I mean, shoot, it's been since Gerard Evans, I think, since you've had this much excitement about a, a quarterback now maybe head and hooker you thought that way and then it was uh you know blunted by the whole covid thing and, and how that went down but uh, going into a season i don't think there's been this much excitement about the quarterback since gerard and you know that was a pretty good season single season for a quarterback here they played in the acc title game uh that position matters and that's why i i think there are such high hopes for this team uh, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, that meme where they have like the low IQ, the middle IQ and the high IQ, and, like the middle one is saying like, oh, they have all this returning production. That's why they're so great on both sides of the ball. And the, the culture that Brent, Fott, like, that's what the, the middle <laughs> one would say. And then the low IQ and the high IQ, maybe like Kyron drones is back and he's really good. <laughs> yeah. Like this, just the quarterback is good. So just bet, you know, bet on the quarterback being good. So, uh, I think that's why there's so much excitement around this team is that, you know, drones has a really high ceiling and you saw what this team did once it became the full 10 starter last year and he's getting better I mean, he's only started 10 games in his career. I think, yeah, I think that's, that's right. what's crazy. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is a guy who's going to get better as he continues to play. And I think that's why, you know, pretty high hopes for this offense. And the staff showed that they know how to use him last year, which uh, or at least after the first couple starts, they, they showed they knew how to use him, um, which I think is critical. Uh, I think he's got a higher ceiling than Gerard Evans because and he's got a better arm. When Gerard threw, especially on the D ball, his passes they had some flutter to him. And I, I think I think uh, Drones has a little bit more. Don't arm let talent. him hear you say that. I know. Don't let him hear you say that. He's still proving the haters wrong. He's going to prove it on Twitter. Day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but at any rate, it's, I, like, I, it's I, like one of those like nobody is sliding your time here. Virginia. Right. Right. Like, You're oh, people, great. It's it's like that tweet that people's like, oh, somebody's always saying something like, oh, I heard Steph Curry couldn't shoot. It's like nobody's ever said that. No, in your one life. single it's person like, has ever said I that. I feel like Gerard is feels like he's slighted for some reason. Like everybody right. said you were great in right. your one season. Maybe Seth Greenberg said that. Yeah, I don't know who these people are that are like, <laughs> no, Gerard Evans wasn't that good. No, he was he fantastic was when right. he was here. Exactly. Gio, Gio, the thing about drones is that I think he, last year was just a taste of what he can do. I, I think that's why everybody's so excited. It's like okay. Kyron Jones is back. Uh, he's got all these weapons around them. Like this offense, like Andy said, the only guy who's not back from last year's offense was Daquan Wright. Ollie Jennings is back healthy. And then you add all these pieces. It's like on paper, the group should take a step forward led by drones and drones should take his next step forward. And he was already a pretty good quarterback when he found his rhythm and got into it last year. I still remember him starting the Rutgers game and he had that botched exchange on, on the, that's just, that's the first drive. Promising start, right? First drive as a, <laughs> as a starter um, in his college career. But he, you saw him kind of grow over the course of the season. And obviously he was the mil, the, the military bowl game MVP for, for what he did in Annapolis. This is a guy that, that is super talented yeah, I would say, probably say most hype around a quarterback since Gerard Evans. And it is kind of refreshing, I think. A, l- a little bit bum, a bummer because uh, a quarterback controversy, drama, battle always 
you know, people are always in tune. People always want to know what's going on with the quarterbacks. But having that debate settled going into the year, it's kind of nice. I, it's to- a, it's nice and I told you calm. this is going to be a boring preseason. Yeah. Yeah. It has yeah. been. Exactly. Has Largely been. because of the quarterback spot. It, yeah. It's just so settled. Exactly. That's something that hasn't happened here forever. It's a long time, man. Uh, it's, uh, I think Drones... He's going to continue to improve. The biggest question is when it's third and eight, can he get down to his third read, third and his fourth read on those plays and become a more you know, natural, progressive passer? Um, last year, it, and it was a situation where when Tech was winning, he never rarely had to do that because they were just blowing people off the ball. And then when he needed to do it, he really couldn't do it. He just wasn't that progressed as a passer at that point. That's his, the next stage of his development is uh, getting to that third read, being able to scan the field more from left to right or vice versa because so many of Tech's successful pass plays last year were to the first read or the second read. And he would rather ha- he would rarely have to switch his eyes to the other side of the field. That's the next step in his development. Uh, if he does that, then the passing game will improve quite a bit. If he does that and the offensive line also takes a big step forward, then this is going to be like a dominant offense. It's going to go from being good to absolutely dominant. Um, we just don't know whether those two things are going to happen yet. I think I think to, to piggyback on your point, like the biggest thing for drones that was missing, right? You can, like the, the ratio is great. 17 touchdowns, three interceptions, mm-hmm. not to mention the touchdowns on the ground. And obviously that is all four games deep didn't play the first four games uh this well obviously played in the a little bit there but didn't get into the full new offense and everything like that uh after the first four games of the season but completed 58 percent of his passes you'd like to see that get towards the low 60s He's, if possible I, I asked him uh in charlotte where he'd like to improve and he said i'd like to get more accurate i guess the the key number would be 70 percent, but at the same time 70s high 70s high but he throws it away so much. Like, he's very much a team player. You can tell by sometimes his best play was throwing it Getting into the it, yeah. into the East stands, which he seemed to do a whole lot when he was rolling to his right. Um, but he, he didn't mess around with a whole bunch of downfield throws that were going to be, like, that were into coverage. I mean, he was very much about winning the game and not his own completion percentage and things like that, which you appreciate yeah. as a fan. And I, and I think he knew – a lot of players don't understand their own limitations. I think he knew he was very inexperienced as a passer, and and he was, uh, I don't want to say afraid, but I think he was conservative about when he was going to turn it loose and things like that because he knew he knew he w- wasn't necessarily seeing everything because he was such a new player. But uh, I expect you know there to be more confidence there this year, and I, his his I'm sure his completion percentage will go up. I'd be shocked if it did. Well, also he wasn't a very good passer on downfield passing yeah he connected on a couple of them but the overall oh, numbers I were forgot, not great i forgot about that we do have to talk about that it was actually out of any quarterbacks with what 200 plus dropbacks he was actually dead last in a uh, long passing percentage last year of any pass that traveled 20 or more yards in the, the acc air. or in no, the country, the country. Wow. Like out, which yeah. is weird because i remember him hooking up with Daquan Felton a couple times. Oh, yeah, yeah. Multiple passes. times. Yeah. Well, I know just, Felton dropped one at the Rutgers game. He did, so he did. It's so a little worse with that. But, right. uh, but I, yeah, it was not good. Um, like, you remember the big plays. You remember the long pass against Pitt and things like that. But a lot of those other uh, runs were, like, Jalen Lane, 75 yards, right? But that pass didn't travel 20 yards in the right. air. Short pass, and he turns into a long Same game. thing for, like, the day Quan Felton won against UVA when he uh, when he took it to the house, right? And I think Lane had another one in that game. Or that was the one that, that got wiped back. out. You're yeah. right. You're right. I, I think the um, two long bomb ones were against Pitt and Syracuse. Right. They each had a drone strike, right. so to speak. Right, exactly. Uh, but, yeah, not good on the deep balls last year. Um And his big-time throw rate was right middle of the pack in the ACC. So basically his highest success rate last year came when guys were just running wide open. Um, Not that he wasn't great. I'm not suggesting that. Uh, (laughs) One of the reasons they were running wide open is because Tech's running game was so good, and he was a big part of that. Yeah. Um, uh, But Pry has talked about there's progressions he can make as a quarterback, and downfield passing is one of those. Um, so that, that's a good point, Andy. Probably So I guess probably if I was a defensive coordinator, your question earlier was like, what would I try to uh, take away if I'm a defensive coordinator? Force him to throw it deep? I'd probably play my safeties 
you can't really do this because Tech's running game is so good. But on <clears throat> on obvious passing downs, I'm playing my safeties deep and uh, take away the deep ball. And if he can thread the needle and progress through his reads and beat you, then that shows he's improved. You tip your cap, you move on, you try something else. But I would definitely take away that deep ball. See, I'm interested. That's interesting because I thought you were gonna say play the safeties up tighter, take away that in the middle because that's where he beats you, and make him make the mistake deep. Yeah, I since guess, he can't. Yeah, since that's he pretty, can't hit that, that. That's probably what I should have said. Yeah, <laughs> the one but, time I will ever out yeah. football Chris I, Coleman. I, I pictured it in my head wrong. Um, yeah, Gio's been playing a lot of NCAA. He's been playing a lot. Of <laughs> yeah, Gio, how much do you adjust your defenses when you're playing NCAA? Uh, Defense, dude. I I win big old school Big Twelve shootouts like fifty two <laughs> so no, to forty five because well, I can't get a defensive Andy, stop. Andy, Andy, write that down for Sunday. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I don't even play defense. I'm an offensive coordinator in New Mexico, <laughs> so I just I just worry about my guys. All right, uh, where my feet are in New Mexico, we're trying to do well. I'm just worried about my guys. I, I don't have time for defense. There you go, there you go. I uh, started as the OC at Buffalo, but. We, we've moved up to head coach. If you do as good a job at New Mexico as Jerry Kill did at New Mexico State. Hey, I got to the playoff last year. The, pl- it, it ended, the college football playoff. Yeah, it, it ended in a What a fashion. realistic game this is, y'all play. It That's was. the fun of it, Chris. <laughs> I can't wait for our tech sideline gathering this weekend so Chris can be there watching us play the game and just complaining about it nonstop. I, I might live tweet Chris's complaints about the game. <laughs> as we're doing I can that. list them all. There's a bunch. We're going to we're gonna have to vlog uh, the, the, the party. No, to be Andy's. fair, I haven't seen it played on like decent slider settings. Like, what are legit slider settings that make it a realistic game? They're, they're, Rather than, like, when I was watching you all play and Nick Gallo was running over the entire Georgia <laughs> defense, right? What difficulty were you guys on? Varsity? I'm running on All-American. All-American. There you go. That's still with the sliders. I used to play on Heisman, and I would download, like, the these the sliders, yeah. certain yep. slider settings. Yeah, People have TikTok videos on that. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about dabbling to try and make the defense a little more real because yes. I cannot buy a stop most of the time. Oh, no. no you just have to outscore. Yeah. Um, serious question. Colin Schley, definite QB two and then pop third. Is that where we're sitting? I think so. I think so. We're actually talking to Schley tomorrow and hopefully pop, uh, trying to get him on the request list. Um, I would think that's the direction they're going to go just because of experience. Uh, and I don't think that changes anything about the direction they're thinking in the future because, you know, obviously Schley is in his last year. Uh, I think pop long-term is the number two guy you want to develop, but, in a pinch right now, if you know drones goes down in the game, I think I think you'd want to put Schley in the game, and especially since I think there's a lot of similarities in style with how he runs the ball and mm-hmm. could yeah you, know, you know have continuity in this running game if he goes in the in the contest. The fact of the matter is he's been a starting quarterback before on a good one. He was good at Kent State. Um, he started the bowl game this past year for UCLA and just ran all over Boise State before he got hurt. I'm actually like I was surprised he came to Virginia Tech. Because I think he's good enough to start somewhere. Yeah, a little bit. Maybe the money was right. Maybe I mean, it was. It can always be. Maybe, the maybe case. you know if you're not going to go to the NFL and you've got one year left and you've got a chance to. What if you if you, like you get like a hundred grand or Ring something chasing? like that is uh, to be an important backup for a team that wins the ACC yeah, yeah, championship? I mean, well, not even. I mean, it's it's uh, look backup quarterbacks. Virginia Tech fans should know this. They're worth some money. Right? Or at least they should be. <laughs> they get in the game. But you're right. Hey, it's not bad being the backup quarterback because you, you go, you practice all the time. You get the, the glory of being on the team. Everybody thinks you're awesome. Right. Because you're never put in the game for the, you to prove otherwise. So everybody <laughs> loves the backup quarterback. And, you know, if Drone struggles I, I one say, game, yeah. I guarantee you, I'll go to our football board and somebody's going to be like, I'd be real interested in seeing what Colin Schley could do. After <laughs> like, <that."> besides, <laughs> besides fired head football coach in college, backup NFL quarterback is probably yes. the best job. Like, Chase Daniel, how much money did Chase Daniel make in his career? Like, it's a pretty good gig being a backup quarterback. Mm-hmm. Jim Sorgi for the longest time with the Colts. It's like, this is great. And you don't I get never hit. have to go in the game. Virginia Tech, Don Strzok. Yeah. Was Dan, Dan I've Reno's got a no contact forever. jersey on in practice. Like, don't come near me in practice. Don't hit me yeah. at all. Like, this is a pretty good lifestyle. I Great think. job. Yeah, no doubt. And they get paid bank in the NFL yeah. for sure. All right. This concludes our podcast. Just last thing. 
what what is the what is the ceiling and basement for this offense heading into this year? What what looks like a dominant offense? It just seems like it's in the cards to to be a possibility. The the lowest point I could see it being is exactly what it turned into last year. A good offense that matched up well with certain teams and matched up poorly with other teams and and that struggled to throw the ball when teams knew they were going to throw. Um, that's what will happen if the offensive line doesn't improve and if Jerome's doesn't make progress getting past like the second read on third round, third down. If both those things happen, then it's going to be dominant, in my opinion, and if it stays healthy. Yeah, I, I think the, the ceiling's very high if the O-line develops and they have this you know pass-run split that you can't really home in on one and like figure out what you're going to stop. But uh, the, the low side of that is if you have – troubles pushing you know really physical lines off the ball and you're playing Miami and you're playing Clemson you can't get anything going on the ground that that's where all of a sudden you become one dimensional and that's when defenses can really you know crush your offense so uh that's that's why I keep saying O-line is is the key to this offense because I think if they can be good decent or good I think that unlocks everything else with this group they have yeah I'm on the same page as Andy uh, I think there's so much talent everywhere if the offensive line improves, takes that next step, and I think you're already seeing Kyron Drones kind of taking that next step himself, you'll have a really good offense that people probably lose their mind game planning for. I mean, just between the between stopping Basial Tutin and stopping Kyron Drones in the run game, but also the RPOs and the passes, and there are so many really good wide receivers. Um, Tech schemed it up really well last year. Um, that made it really, really hard to stop until it lost the battle in the trenches against the really good teams. If Tech can win those battles in the trenches, Rutgers is probably going to be the first real sense we get of that, I think. You're, you're going to have an offense that I think can be really, really tough to stop. I would argue maybe the most important key to this offense's success is – starting game strong whether that's offensively or defensively they kind of got in holes early last year all of a sudden you're in a little bit of a hole you're forced to throw the ball you can't run the ball as much because you're playing against the clock gotta have it doesn't even have to be like a, a foot in the ground like exclamation point start just like don't be out of it from the get-go with a, a fumble the other way for a touchdown stuff like that yeah um i think if you get off to a good start and you can get get a lead early you can really home in on your game plan early right. and establish the running game. And uh, it puts the other team in a position where they have to throw it more. And then they're, you know, I think for Virginia Tech, that's what you want them to do. I think you want them to throw the ball at, at Dorian Strong and Mansoor Delane. Start fast. That's an old newspaper writer's trick when you have to do with keys for a game because then you have to grade them start fast is when you can grade in the first quarter right <laughs> yeah so it would always be one of the three keys is start fast but you're right <laughs> you know that's the key to any football game is you know, when they were down what 22 nothing in the first quarter against florida, <laughs> florida state, state yeah. uh I mean, somehow they, they were down 22 17 they were down early against at purdue right yeah and then they came back yeah. right um, went down early yeah. against yeah. Rutgers. Yeah. Rutgers. nc state yeah. jumped on them uh, Louisville jumped on him and didn't relent. And yeah, it was start right. to finish in that game. But I mean, um, yeah, I think they could have competed with NC State if they didn't start as terribly as they did because yeah. they came back in that game. But uh, yeah, you don't want to. This offense is more effective when you're the aggressor and you don't have to be one dimensional and go to the air and throw the ball all the time because you know this running game can really grind people down. So start fast. Good key to the C. I can grade that one early. <laughs> start <laughs> fast and don't turn it over. There you go. I mean, we're just based, list, listing the tenets of football. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> play, <laughs> physical, tackle, really start right. fast. And you, Chris, you mentioned it, or Gio, you mentioned it. Drones only threw three picks last year, but I think there were there were times where the, the fumbles it just un, uncharacteristic um, or just in bad moments. And you, Gio, you brought up Tootin. Like if Tootin can kind of sh- clean that up a little bit, Drones can kind of clean that up. Good ball security, like. You know, and you can start fast, and like you're golden, man. 
the other the other day I was listening to the College Game Day podcast and Reese Davis was like, you must rivet the football to your rib cage <laughs> when talking about taking care of the football and, and not and not fumbling it. So on that note, we're hype about the offense. Join us next time. We're going to talk all about the defense. So much to unpack there. So much to be excited about. And we're getting ready for a banger at Andy's on Saturday night. For Nick Brown, for David Cunningham, for Andy Bitter, for Chris Coleman, I'm Giovanni Heater saying so long. We'll see you next time on the Tech Sideline Podcast.